Welcome back. Joining me today is Rajesh Subramanian. He is the founder and the CEO of Embed Your Systems. Rajesh, welcome to today's show. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for having me here. So for the listeners, Rajesh, can you give background of your, uh, maybe we we'll start from your education level, your experience prior to Embed Your, and, and what brought you up for the inspiration of this company? Again, first of all, thanks to you and thanks to everybody in the studio for giving me an opportunity to be here. It's great to uh, be back here and talking to you. Uh, 1994 is when I uh, came, came into the country. Actually, 1992 is when I came into the country. Um, grew up in India, southern part of India, in a city called Chennai. And I went to school there, masters. I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering, moved to the United States. 92 to 94, finished my masters, moved to the Silicon Valley. And this was the time when there were a lot of startups around um, Silicon Valley. Uh, telecom was booming. Um, internet was a big thing. Netscape, I mean, I still remember the days where people used to use Gopher and then Netscape and then Google and it was a huge transformation. I was looking around, got a, f a few jobs in multiple corporations and I eventually thought that uh, there's an ideal opportunity being in Silicon Valley to be able to make a difference in the industry that I was working in. And as a result, with uh, two other colleagues of mine, decided to start Embed Your Systems. I had been through three, uh, two startups and a big company, yeah. and I had the mindset where, you know, I've been through a big company, I've been through a small company, maybe this is the time to go out on my own and start and see how it progresses. And so we started Embed Your Systems in 2004, July, and the focus was gonna be supporting service providers and basically telecom and data networking equipment vendors and uh, so-called OEMs and being able to provide virtual R&D and product engineering for them. So that is how uh, I got started. Now when you started, did you actually have clients lined up or did you just start with a concept, a plan, a vision and, and then say, we'll figure that out later? It's, well, there were no customers first. Yeah. So we had this grand vision of uh, starting and we had a business plan and we laid out certain metrics and uh, we said, we're gonna try this for nine months or 10 months to begin with. So the goal was to start. Um, we put together a plan in uh, August of 2004, September of 2004, this plan was well formulated. And in Jan of 2005, we took it to action. And we said, let's stick with this plan for seven to eight months and let's see if we sign up customers. So we started approaching customers and eventually we signed up our first customer around July or August. So six to seven months was real hard work and being focused, follow one course until being successful. So it was waiting it out and making sure that we find the right customer to be able to start the process of building the company. What was it like getting your first customer? Oh, it was like winning a Super Bowl, you know? This was, uh, you know, where I see players just hitting the turf and they're crying. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, it was like, it was a testament to staying the course, persevering always wins. And uh, it was, I still, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, have, I'm having goose pimples the moment I think of that experience. Because um, it was, you end up doubting yourself through time. And you have responsibilities. I mean, I had two kids who were really small. Uh, my younger one was two years old, my elder one was five years old, and I'm going like, am I doing the right thing here? I mean, I don't have a paycheck. After being used to this semi-monthly paycheck coming in, I don't have a paycheck, and I'm going like, oh my God, is this gonna work out? But then I said, this is my opportunity. I gotta go big and try it. And when the first customer came in, it was like, yes. And uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. Now, the Embedger specializes in embedded systems. Yep. And for the listeners, can you explain what is an embedded system? So an embedded system, most of the time, there are a lot of these electronic devices that you buy from Best Buy, uh, from Amazon, um, from different stores, Target, wherever, and uh, you look at it as an electronic box. It's a big black box. But there are a lot of things that happen within the box. There's a silicon in it, which is basically processors and other hardware that, manuf that is manufactured by these big silicon companies. Example, likes of Intel, likes of Qualcomm, Marvell, Broadcom, and many others. And they all have to be designed in together. And there is some special software that goes in to this system to build the capability of the system. So if you buy a uh, Fitbit, 
I mean, it's got electronics in it, it's got software in it. If you buy a router from Best Buy, it's got electronics in it, it's got software in it. And if you buy any other device, which is an electronic gadget, it's a combination of all of this. To us, we call this an embedded system, which has its own processors, its own peripheral electronics, and its own software. And all these come together to make this one big box. I'm visiting here today with Rajesh Subramanian. And Rajesh, I need to take a quick break. Sure. And we'll be right back after these messages. Thank you. Grandpa, can we do chemistry? Papa, Daddy. Grandpa, let's do some kid fun. We'll help you stay organized so you can focus on what really matters in life. Give us a call today and see how we can help you start saving taxes. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm visiting here today with Rajesh Subramanian. He is the founder of Embedger. And uh, Rajesh, in the, the previous segment, we talked about embedded systems and how they apply to electronic devices. What's the fastest area in the industry of embedded systems today of growth? Well, there are a lot of different things that have happened over the last five to eight years. If you um, were to look at it, the Internet of Things is a big vertical that's growing really, really fast sensors, electronics, wearables, and Internet of Things associated with all of these is a very fast growing segment. And on top of that, we have devices, especially wireless, which has just grown and continues to grow. When I'm talking about wireless, I'm talking about licensed spectrum wireless, unlicensed spectrum wireless. And the combination of all of this is led to a big infrastructure growth as well in terms of traditional switching equipment has become important and that is growing fast. Data center businesses are going fast. Cloud is going fast, growing fast. As a result, all of this is pushing more devices into the market and the growth segment is looking huge. So to answer your question, IoT is a big thing that's uh, proliferating across the board. And, and since we are specialized in Wi-Fi, which is unlicensed spectrum Wi-Fi, that is a growth segment that we're seeing, uh, which continues to build momentum and continues to grow across the world. So in the area of, uh, when you look at the, the development of this new technology, the 5G, how is that going to affect your industry? I think as technologies, as new technologies come in, they always create disruptions. Um, for us, there are a lot of growth indicators and growth factors. So this machine to machine, the, the moment the, the 5G and the 4G and the LTE revolution took place, what you call M to M or machine to machine communication increased tremendously. So as a result, when this communication increases uh, uh, tremendously, there are applications, the killer apps that come into play. So we believe that this is going to enable more IoT, more growth in IoT, because at the end of the day, you need to be able to communicate over the internet and 5G and all of this technology and even Wi-Fi. There's a new standard that's come out called 11AX and that's going to be launched probably later this year by uh, many different companies around the world. And all of this put together, along with 5G and licensed and unlicensed Wi-Fi, is only going to increase the velocity with which these IoT or Internet of Things devices are going to proliferate the market. You know, with the, when you look at uh, net neutrality, I guess the FCC is starting to get involved with, with things. And what, what, give, give some background. What's going on there? I, I think um, there are a lot of different views about this topic and yeah. every person shares a uh, specific concern or a viewpoint. And, um, First you of know, all, what is it? I mean, net neutrality is basically saying, do all of us have equal rights to being able to use the internet or the capacity with which we consume content? Yeah. And, um, and, and can somebody prioritize and monetize it differently for different services. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of arguments for and against, but I believe we should leave it, I mean, being a capitalistic society, I believe that the companies that have invested in the infrastructure are the ones that should be able to at least reap the benefits of all this huge infrastructure investment that they put in. And as a result, there should be some consideration towards these big corporations, service providers, especially all the people who have put in all of this infrastructure together to be able to reap the benefits and then taper it off so that everybody 
gets an equal piece of the pie once that investment cost is amortized across a span of several years. So an example here, if, say PG&E puts all the power lines up, someone comes along and says, the power lines are up, I should be able to use Exactly, it's, it's fair game now. Yeah, it's fair game now. I should be able to use the power lines. I mean, everybody uses it, so it doesn't make sense. I mean, PG&E yeah. is for a profit, for profit business. Yeah. And at the end of the day, PG&E has to monetize it. So the moment they monetize it, Yes, there's always talk about big corporations pay themselves first before they take care of their customers, but it incentivizes the people who have invested money in it to be able to put back more money into the business, and it's only better for customers in the long run. So in, uh, in this world of capitalism, it's, it makes sense to let people continue to monetize. Exactly, and, and the moment if people step in and participate in arguing who gets what, then it becomes complicated. Okay, I'm visiting here today with Rajesh Sarinian. I need to take another break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Great on. can't take your wealth with you, spend time with your family. Welcome back. I'm busy here today with Rajesh Subramanian, and we're talking about embedded systems yeah. and, you know, the, the state of the industry. And uh, I'm going I'm to turn the page of the future of the Internet of Things. Where do you see all this going? Oh, wow. This is a great question. <clears throat> what is happening is devices are becoming commodities. I mean, if you really think about that, Silicon Valley is stepping up the game in terms of taking innovative approaches to software and how we solve problems. Devices are going to be a commodity business, by which I mean monetization is going to start coming down in terms of profitability on devices, which means innovative solutions, cloud computing, being able to provide algorithms in the cloud, understanding human behavior, and solving problems based on behavior and data being collected is the next big thing that is taking shape. So securing data, collecting data, analyzing data, mining data, having algorithms then decipher the data and creating patterns these are the big things that are happening today. And if you look at the cloud technology, Amazon, with Amazon Web Services, they have been in the forefront of this. This is, this is a genius move, and it's just, I'm, I'm just completely amazed with the vision that Jeff Bezos had when he first started this whole um, Amazon Web Services. And they've put a lot of other companies out of business. And what, the, what this does is gives anybody access to a huge compute platform where I can run specific algorithms and shape behaviors and then control multiple things in different facets of life on a daily basis. And that's where this is going. What do you see as the most beneficial application? So I was talking to somebody, there are a lot of different applications. I was talking to somebody where, you know, I was talking to this, uh, this, this person from a chip company, he's a very, uh, very senior leader and uh, he was talking about, oh, we can use Wi-Fi technology where these APs that are sitting in your house can read, you know, the different aspects of your heartbeat and sense your heartbeat. And if the heartbeat slows down, can immediately trigger an alarm to the cloud, which then triggers, you know, a health monitoring system to be able to come in and, in fact, enable you to stop heart attacks or even create a, a time interval where the response time is completely, completely accelerated and save lives. I mean, so many different things are happening where all of this data, like I said, being able to collect data and being able to analyze data, health, um, transportation, automation, industrial. I mean, every aspect of life is gonna change based on what we do to autonomous cars. Again, it's all about how the car moves, what sensors do you have, collecting all the data, and this huge compute engine then directs the car 
to do the, do the right thing. Do you see a, 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 def, a definite leader in the area of artificial intelligence as this industry is coming out? I mean, you can, th there are many different companies. Again, there are multiple verticals in terms of um, what, uh, what we see. Of course, Tesla has already done a lot of things with this autonomous car, self-driving cars, and Google is coming in, and Apple is, uh, is, is, is already coming in with a lot of different innovation. So I wouldn't say there's one single company that's spearheading this, but again, the company that's provided the platform and the infrastructure is, is Amazon, and, and they've come up with Alexa, and they've kind of tried to pivot the whole industry there. And it becomes very important. I, I want to make a point here. If the internet was not as fast as it is today, none of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it goes back to the fundamental philosophy where you got to have a strong and a big pipe. Yeah. The pipe was enabled with mm -hmm. fiber, light, 10 gig, mm -hmm. multiple gig, fast transportation. Mm -hmm. Once that was enabled, infrastructure. Amazon came in. Many other companies followed suit, cloud, computing, and infrastructure. Now we have the base platform set in, and every vertical now has an opportunity to participate and create a difference. Where do you see embedded systems going into the five, five years into the future here? Like I said, I mean, uh, we, we've been working on hardware and we've been working on software as well, but our hardware uh, revenue stream has decreased tremendously. So we do maybe 1% or even zero, I would say, in the last two, three years. And uh, it's all significant software, um, where we believe we can add a difference in this old system, uh, ecosystem is where we build software. So open networking, software-defined networking, open devices, being able to compute at the cloud and making the devices really thin. So the devices are manufactured out of the country, focus on low price, but bring in monetizable value by creating subscri subscription services and then enabling different applications on top of that. That's where we see this going and that's where we're trying to pivot NVIDIA to that vertical. These chips seem to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, an SOC system on a chip, I mean, everything is smaller now. I mean, um, every device is getting smaller, it's more compact, but it does a lot more. Been visiting here today with Rajesh Sambarmanian, and uh, he's the founder and the CEO of Embed Your System. So, Rajesh, if someone was interested in engaging your services or getting a hold of you, how would they go about that? Um, they can visit us at www.embedyo.com, um, and then there's an email. They can fill in a form. It goes to our marketing department, and then they will reach out and uh, support and take any calls and see how we can support our future customers and prospect of customers. Thanks for being on today's show. Well, thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back after these messages. <laughs>